This week on Triangulation, we have a woman who has done so much to make us all more secure on the net, creator uh, and maintainer for years of Let's Encrypt and HTTPS Everywhere uh, and Privacy Badger when she was at EFF. She's now Chief Security Officer at Brave, a privacy-focused browser. Yanju, a.k.a. Bcrypt, next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 411, recorded Friday, August 23rd, 2019. Yan Ju, a.k.a. Bcrypt. It's time for Triangulation, the show where we get together with some of the most interesting people in technology and spend an hour talking about whatever it is excites us. <laughs> and I'm really excited today to have kind of a legend in security on with us. Bcrypt is here, Yan Zhu. Hello, Yan. Hey, Leo. Great Good to see to be you. Here. Currently yeah. Chief Security Officer at Brave, one of my favorite browsers. Uh, but you have a long and glorious career working for many of the best companies in the business, doing security. And can, do, you, do you ever use the, uh, the, the name hacker, the term hacker? Uh, for, all just, the time, yeah. yeah. That's a proud yeah. term. <laughs> it is. I, I feel like CISO is too corporate-y, and yeah. I, I don't feel like I identify with like most of corporate security. So hacker seems more fitting. Yeah, and and is security your primary uh, focus? Um, these days, yeah, I think like privacy is pretty closely related, and in some some sense, I focus more on privacy than security. So you've been at Yahoo. You've been at, at the EFF. Uh, mm -hmm. You're currently at at uh, at Brave, um, right. let, but I kind of uh, and forgive me if you don't want to talk about it. But I want to go back a little farther to the beginning because I'm always interested in how somebody becomes what you are. You're you were born in China. Uh, yep, a long time ago. Yep, many <laughs> hundreds of years ago. <laughs> hundreds of years. <laughs> a long time from your point of view, right? Your family came uh, to the U.S. where? Well, so I was born in Beijing, um, and my dad was a geophysics student at the time. Mm -hmm. So he uh, he was like incredibly talented and worked really hard. And he got into um, Caltech for his PhD program. Nice. Um, yeah. So that was a big deal. But he um, he didn't really have like the money to bring his whole family over. Like it was just my mom and me at the time. Um, so he moved here uh, when I was like two, and then a year later, my mom came over, and then I finally moved to the United States when I was about five years old. And stayed. Yeah, and I've been here since. <laughs> yeah, so you were in Palo Alto or the or that area? Um, yeah, so, well, I actually grew up all over the place. Like, uh, I lived in Pasadena, which is near L.A., um, first when I moved to the U.S. and then my family moved to St. Louis, Missouri, which is kind of a cultural shock. Yeah, no <laughs> You've kidding. lived on either <laughs> coast for most of your life. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, and then went to college in Boston and finally ended up in San Francisco. Well, that's what's kind of interesting. Yeah. So uh, according to Wikipedia, you dropped out of high school. Yeah, I did. Um, like I said, I, I went to... Uh, I was in St. Louis. I went to an inner city public school in St. Louis. So it wasn't quite, you know, like the the kind of experience or education people get from like fancy private schools. You know, like I didn't learn computer science. Um, you know, I had really good teachers, but there wasn't just like a curriculum that was challenging. So mm -hmm. uh, at some point I was just like, screw it. Like, what's the point of spending time in high school if I feel like I'm not learning anything. Right. So that makes sense. Um, yeah, I dropped out right before my last year of high school. And it, already an interest in technology? Um, somewhat. Actually, back then I was trying to, I, I was convinced I wanted to be like a music soundtrack composer. Nice. Um, like a Hans like Zimmer. Will yeah, or Hans Zimmer or John, John Williams. Williams. Yeah, <laughs> maybe John Williams. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah. that's cool. So, yeah, yeah, so music also has always been a big part. Uh, uh, Jan is also a DJ. Her SoundCloud is, <laughs> uh, is uh, Azuki, A-Z-U-K-I, where there's that's lots right. of music there. Um, Thanks. So this was a mix for you. Actually, it's not unusual for 
uh, programmers, computer scientists, hackers to also have a deep love for music and understanding. I've often thought there's a relationship between mathematics and music. Oh yeah, there certainly is. Um, you know, like if you look at the, the, the sounds that sound good to us, you know, there's like this specific integer ratio between frequencies, um, and harmonics. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So there's a, it's, it seems pretty deeply connected to math. Did you start programming or uh, coding in high school? What was it that you were doing? <laughs> um, no, like I said, I, I mean, it's really good to, when I talk to like younger people these days in high school um, and they tell me like, oh, my, my school, which is just a public school, has like this computer science class. I'm like, that's awesome. Like uh, back when I was growing up, we didn't have that. So I, yeah, I basically never uh, really programmed until late in college. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So how yeah, did you, so sure. you, so you dropped out of high school, but you still got into MIT. Uh, yeah, there's kind of a long story there. Um, people like people trying to go to college right now, like, like people who are applying ask me this all the time. It's like, how do you get into a pretty good school without having finished high school, which I didn't. Um, and the honest answer is I have no idea. Like, I, I have no idea how <laughs> to do You can't replicate um, my path. Yeah. It was a yeah, random yeah. I mean, walk. It didn't, yeah, yeah. I remember I wrote, like, on my application, like, uh, like I wrote this long kind of heartfelt story about how, uh, you know, high school just felt like it wasn't fulfilling. Like, I felt like I was wasting my time. And, you know, I knew I could just, like, move further if I was in a, a better environment. So well, You convinced them yeah. somehow. <laughs> I guess that that worked. What was your um, but major? actually I forgot your original question. Well, I just you was wondering how you made that path, but <laughs> but I think you made that excellent point, which is it's not mm -hmm. a path some can some anybody can duplicate. You have to find your own path. What was your major? Yeah. What was your major? And, and that's like something I try to tell people all the time is like you know like people ask me for advice and I say like my best advice is just don't listen to other people's yes. advice because you know yourself the best, right? Yes. Yeah. And actually, coming from somebody like you who's clearly a, an iconoclast. Um, that's inspiring because you made it, you did it. And so you can do it. And, uh, in, and, and I think that's inspiring, especially I have to say for young women, because you're in a field where there aren't a lot of women. Yeah, actually two, two fields where there aren't a lot of women, which are, um, like technology and uh, electronic music. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Does that, is that a challenge or is it something you just shrug off? Um, I, th I think I tend to shrug it off. I, I think, you know, we have to respect the fact that everyone's experiences are different and some people face a lot more adversity than yeah, others, depending right. on their environment and other factors. So, but I would say for myself, it, it you know, like the topic of gender doesn't come up very often um, for me. Like, I don't feel like I'm being discriminated against or opposed oppressed for most part uh, but maybe that's just like a lack of observation on my part so i, I don't want to like, you have to kind of become immune to it because there is it's it's out there and if you start to focus on the yeah, microaggressions sure. <laughs> and the little snotty yeah. asides then it becomes consuming but yeah. i do feel like technology particularly is one area where it could be a meritocracy that you could be judged on your skill uh, uh -huh. regardless of your background yeah, I, I go, I, I have kind of mixed feelings about this because uh, I do think it's a field where, um, like if you compare it to, to something like music, where in order to become successful and popular, you have to do all these things that aren't actually related to the quality of work that you're producing. Like it's all branding and marketing, self-promotion, et cetera. And I, I feel like in technology as a whole, it's much more about just if you can code or not. Um, and also if you're an easy person to work with. So yeah, at least like the things that get you ahead in tech are, are pretty much directly skill-based. Um, and that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. For sure. Um, there's so many things I want to, uh, talk to you about. <laughs> um, let's talk about Brave real quickly. Uh, how long mm -hmm. have you been there? Oh my God. So, so I started in 2015. So practically, I mean, I don't remember yeah, it before. Four years. It wasn't even <laughs> out by then, right? Was it? Right. So yeah, I, I heard about it from um, Brendan, Brendan, Brendan Ike, Ike, I guess right. who's mostly known for creating JavaScript, the most hated mm -hmm. programming language. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and the yeah, most so used. I, so there's often a correlation. The yeah. There's yeah, often. A, yeah. Yeah. The more you hate it, the more people use it. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know if that's but, good yeah. or bad, but I think that's the case. Yeah. So he、uh, reached out to me in 2015 when I was at Yahoo and said,、uh, I'm working on the secret project. Do you、nice. want to learn more about it? And I was、nice. like, sure. Yeah. Sounds interesting. And so, yeah, he kind of sold me on the vision. And I started at Brave later that year. And I think we officially launched the browser in. February or January 2016. So, for those who don't know, it's based on Chromium, the open source code that Chrome is based on, but it's privacy and security focused. It also uses something、uh, really interesting called BAT or BAT attention tokens or Brave attention、mm -hmm. tokens, which is a cryptocurrency that can be used to, since you're blocking ads with it,、uh, pay back the creators whose content you're consuming. Um, and that's, very, that's a kind of an interesting way of handling this issue of, well, I don't want to see those ads. By the way, not just because, I mean, we have ads. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with ads. There's a much larger concern these days with ad tech and the security、uh, problems it poses. You've got kind of unvetted code running on your computer coming in from an ad, and it's often problematic. So,、uh, not to mention the size and the weight of these files. Uh, you know, you're loading code from someplace out there that you don't know. You don't know if it's trusted. So there's a lot of good reasons to block ads, completely independent of whether you want to see ads. But it also has that bad side effect of the page you're on isn't, isn't getting paid. So I like the idea. I, I really think Brave is if you want to use a Chrome like browser, even Microsoft's new Chromium based Edge, I, would, I, I, would, I think Brave is the one to use. Uh, it's, as far as I'm concerned, up, right up there with Firefox as a privacy browser. And in fact, it has some features Firefox lacks. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. we definitely、um, were big on privacy.、Um, we did consider being based on、uh, Gecko, which is like the Firefox、mm -hmm. um, engine a long time ago. But、uh, for various reasons, Chromium was.、Uh, Better choice for us. Are you concerned about a browser monoculture, though? I mean, that's been some of the criticism of Microsoft is that, well, now. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a huge concern is、um, like in, in the W3C, which is a standards body that、um, comes up with standards for like various HTML APIs and all the features that browsers are able to make use of.、Um, they have a rule that, like, for something to become a certain level of standardized, there has to be、uh, like two distinct. Uh, engines that render it, so that use it, that make use of this feature. So,、uh, if everything, if literally everyone,、uh, if all browsers were based on Chromium, like that wouldn't even be possible, right? Because there would only be one engine.、Um, so, yeah, I think having diversity in the in, in browser engines is, is a good thing. So,、sure. it's good we have Firefox. It's, it's good we have Firefox.、Yeah. Um, you know, also good we have Safari. <laughs> yeah, Safari. That's WebKit. Yeah, yeah so that's three yeah, engines、exactly. Gecko, WebKit, and whatever the. Whatever. Blink. Yeah. Well, yeah, Google doesn't call it <laughs> Blink.、Something. I mean, it's very confusing out there. Yeah. But essentially, Blink. I should、yeah. also give you a lot of credit because、uh, you have worked on Let's Encrypt,、uh, you worked on HTTPS Everywhere. You're part of the W3C Technical Architecture Group, or at least you were. Are you still? Oh, well, I was,、you、yeah.、Were. That、okay. was a few years ago.、Uh, so、yeah. you have, I mean, and anybody who listens to our shows, especially if you listen to Security Now, knows how important and how critical Let's Encrypt and HTTPS Everywhere are.、Uh, HTTPS Everywhere is incorporated into Brave, isn't it?、Um, yeah. So we, we don't really. So HTTPS Everywhere, for those who don't know, is this、um, browser extension that. Was started at EFF a long time ago. And、um, back in the day, like in the early 2000s, mid 2000s,、uh, there were not that many sites that used HTTPS. Like I think when HTTPS everywhere started, like even Facebook.com wouldn't necessarily.、Uh, yeah. Like, That's when the fire, fire sheep. Taught us all. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You、And、better、so、damn people, well start encrypting. <laughs> yeah. Fire Sheep was a little like, easy to use plugin. I even tried it <laughs> where you go to a coffee shop and you can steal somebody's Facebook token because their traffic is unencrypted and, and post as them on your computer. And that, I think that was the beginning of HTTPS everywhere, the whole movie. Yeah. And th that was kind of what sparked it was、uh, my colleague Peter Eckersley at EFF and I think Mike Perry at the Tor Project. Said,、um, well, you know, these sites support HTTPS, but they don't default to it. So, what if we just made a browser extension where it just automatically went to the HTTPS version of the website when 
it, the HPS is available. And so, you know, over time, the kind of marginal usefulness of this extension has gone down because more sites have started just always defaulting to HTTPS. But um, yeah, there's still some surprising exceptions like sites that don't. And for that, like, HPS everywhere is a pretty good pretty good defense to have. And a little credit to Google too, because Google kind of put their weight behind uh, TSL and, and using HTTPS everywhere. In fact, said, we're not going to rank you as highly if you don't. Uh, yeah, for sure. That's that's a big one too. And, and you know, cr shout out to Chrome too for um, kind of pushing the boundary on like the security indicators, um, you know, starting the discussion around like, what if instead of showing HTTPS sites as secure with the little lock icon in the browser, instead we show HTTP insecure. sites as insecure. <laughs> so now we're like shaming the people who don't do it. Shame, instead of, shame. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, what, what, how do you feel about Google? I mean, you're using a code base that's open source, and yet most of the people working on Chromium are Google employees. Uh, Google is an ad tech company. Um, so there's this kind of tension, I think. Yeah, it, it definitely feels a little bit um, like there's there's many sides to Google as a company. Mm -hmm. um, I will say like I, in all the interactions I've had with their security team, like they've all been very helpful. They're all very competent engineers and I, I like working with them. So yeah, they, they definitely do care about the users too and you know, maybe that doesn't align with Google's some of some of the things the security or privacy team wants to do, don't really align with Google's broader goal um, of you know tracking people and putting ads on stuff. But um, but yeah, they they put in the effort. Yeah, Tavis Ormandy and uh, and Project Zero. Yeah, are, huge fan of Tavis and yeah, Natalie. <laughs> all yeah, those pretty impressive. In fact, I would say of yeah. all of the security researchers out there, they come up with more zero days than than anybody pretty amazing well Do certainly some of the most serious ones yeah the, the um, big ones know, the in, ones in that Apple get a, products <laughs> yeah they get a lot of attention yeah, um, and sure. Google's clearly not you know has given uh, them free reign to do what they do because um, you know I mean it's uh, it's important to everybody that the web be more secure do you do that kind of active bug hunting flaw search not so much anymore these days. Um, yeah, when I was starting out in my security career, I did um, just like some pen testing and mm -hmm. one-off like jobs where it's like, oh, find some vulnerabilities in this site. Do you enjoy um, that? Okay. Yeah, I mean, I did. I think it was kind of a. It's always kind of a, a roller coaster because as a vulnerability finder, you can spend so much time like digging into something trying to find an issue and sometimes you find like things that are bugs but don't end up being um convertible into actual exploits and so that's that can be very frustrating if you feel like you've been going towards this dead end and finally you reach the dead end but when you do find something and it's you know it, it's it's a very you feel like you've done something really clever it's like very satisfying <laughs> well it is very clever I'm, i almost feel like especially with these um these new speculative execution attacks like Spectre and Meltdown mm, and the yeah. fuzzing attacks that people are doing and and things like Rowhammer, these timing attacks that the security community has gotten incredibly sophisticated in their ability to find bugs. Do you think the bad guys are as sophisticated? Um, I think a lot of that work has come out of uh, research groups. Right. Um, I think Universities Spectre, Spectre and stuff. being one yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's uh, like for the actual bad guys, you know, there's much more low, lower right. hanging fruit, depending on what they want to do. Right. If they right. want to hack someone's Facebook account or something like the first path is probably like, you know, like buy their password from a password breach database and see if that works, et cetera. Um, yeah. But I, I think Spectre and like those side channel type attacks are pretty scary and like there's going to be a lot more of them in the oh great years. <laughs> yeah. there is just no like bullet, bullet way to defend so the path the sometimes is from a, a research group finds these things there's going to be some intermediate highly skilled but still intermediate group that kind of weaponizes them and then eventually it gets down to the script kiddies and people who don't understand what they're doing but can use this is that kind of the the flow yeah, I think I think that happens with a lot of of 
uh, exploits that are initially like very new is like people uh, write about it and then someone, you know, even if they're trying to keep the details um, secret to do responsible disclosure, right. um, often someone can figure out like how to make a working proof of concept. From well, it. I'm thinking of something like Eternal Blue, which was an NSA exploit that was leaked. Uh -huh. And then yeah. weaponized and has become a critical part of ransomware because it can make ransomware. Yeah, vulnerable. that's a good example. Yeah. But I don't think that the people who are using the ransomware, they don't seem all that bright. They, I think they don't they probably wouldn't be able to come up with Eternal Blue on their own, but they're perfectly capable of using it. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a large, you know, pyramid base of people yeah, who yes. are just <laughs> There's the elite <laughs> and then there's yeah. the rest of us. So um did you ever consider, because there seems to be a lot of money these days in bug hunting in zero days with companies like Zerodium offering pretty big bug bounties uh, and uh, companies themselves competing, trying to offer big back bug bounties. Do you ever consider that as a, a way of making a living? Um, not, not really. Like if I find something interesting, I'll report it and sometimes get a bounty. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I... Uh, I feel like I like doing defense. I like what Braves do. Oh, interesting. Uh, and so I just, yeah, I'm happy You're, where I am. <laughs> you like playing defense over offense. Um, yeah, well, I, I think they both have a, a, a place, but um, I'm, I'm interested in doing whatever kind of like pushes the internet towards a more secure state. Is it, so uh, what's the motivation for you? Is it intellectual? Is it uh, the pleasure of discovering and, and fixing and, uh, this kind of stuff? Or is it, or you have a higher motivation trying to make the world a better place? What is it motivates you? Yeah, I mean, I think at the top high level motivation, it's the, I, I don't want to spend my time working for a company, even if they're doing super technically interesting work. Like I don't, I just have no interest in working there if I don't feel like I believe in their mission. Um, Cause that, that's how people get burnt out is they say like, oh, I'm spending all my time, which is, you know, so valuable cause you never get your time back um, doing something that I don't really care about. So yeah, uh, yeah I think um, that's, that's part of it. And another one is like, I feel I only want to work on open source software most of the time. Right on. Yeah. Um, cause yeah. I think it's important, you know, for people to be able to inspect source code and know what's going on and also, um, you know, have the freedom to fork a repository and play with it. And you don't like see that. yourself in a cube farm typing away on database login code. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, those jobs have their role. And, you know, no, somebody's got to do it. I think the it. important part is the mission, right? Somebody's like you have to it. be working at, towards yeah, a mission. Just not John Jew. At least sort of believe in. <laughs> yeah. Where did you get Bcrypt as a handle? Oh, my God. Uh, this was, so I joined Twitter actually pretty late. I wasn't really active on it until like 2014, but uh, so Bcrypt is this hash function. I think uh, I'd be embarrassed if I was wrong, but I think invented by David Mazieris. Um, and so uh, I was working on Secure Drop at the time, which is this project for helping whistleblowers anonymously make submissions to journalists it's still very and, widely used by the press yeah. uh, it's a really great thing to have because you need a way yeah. that whistleblowers can safely blow their whistle exactly yeah, yeah. yeah. and so um long story short uh, we were working on something and bucrypt came up as the hashing function um and at the same time i was like i need a twitter handle so i just typed that <laughs> in and it one. wasn't taken so that's that's how i got it and i love your motto <laughs> born too late to explore the earth born too soon to explore the galaxy born just in time to browse dank memes <laughs> yeah that's, that's how i feel about it <laughs> we're talking to yanju she is bcrypt also a zuki on uh, soundcloud a dj a hacker and a uh, security uh, expert CISO right now at Brave, which is my one of my favorite browsers out there. Between Brave and uh, and and Firefox, there's no need for anything else. Uh, just what about Tor browser? <laughs> you know, uh, do you use Tor? Um, so I use Tor tabs and Brave because that's actually something we added. Oh, with, tell me uh, about that. Year, maybe a year ago. Yeah. So um, this is like incognito on steroids. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's supposed to be super incognito mode. Um, you know, I have to preface this by saying like Tor browser is a very incredible feat of engineering mm -hmm. because um, 
you know, it's based on Firefox, which is a pretty good base to start from. But it has this constraint that every, any web request your browser makes has to go through Tor. And it turns out it's that's not trivial to do because your browser makes all kinds of requests like in the background. And having a perfectly leak-proof proxy is a lot of effort. So, um, so with Brave, we kind of um, we're using Chromium, which is actually a harder code base to start from, from like a leak proofing perspective. Um, but we thought like, okay, so sometimes people want to hide their IP address from the websites they're visiting, and a lot of people actually believe that private tabs do things like this, but they don't. Like private tabs don't do anything to change your IP address which is kind of a persistent identifier in some ways. Um, so yeah, we added a feature called Tor private tabs where you can open a new private tab uh, that uses Tor as the transport layer proxy. And uh, yeah, so so it's kind of a, like a more integrated version of Tor browser that's not as leak proof or private as Tor browser, but it is more private than just regular private browsing. This is... Um... Yeah, this is, I always struggle with this because I think um, by putting in incognito modes or private browsing modes in the browser, people look at that and go, oh, great, I'm safe, and use it and don't understand how little <laughs> they're, they're, they're protecting themselves with incognito mode uh, in any browser. And, and, and so it is important, but in, in a way, I kind of, it, it angers me that the, 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 Google and Safari and others are uh, are doing this. Although there has been a, a little seesaw battle lately. Google tried to improve its incognito mode um, because newspapers like the New York Times were, were able to see that you were in incognito mode and reject your traffic. That worked for about a minute. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then there, and then another fingerprinting method came up and now they block your traffic again. Um, but that's kind of missing the whole point, isn't it, of anonymity on the internet? Yeah, I mean, people, um, yeah, I think there's been research studies on this, usability studies where people demonstrate that they don't really know what incognito no, mode does. I know they don't. I didn't. Um, and even browsers, like, don't completely agree on it. I think, like, every browser might have a slightly different um, implementation of incognito when it comes to, like, the 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 edge cases and details of it. So, yeah, I mean, I think... Do you uh, want to make a, a Brave kind of a uh, one button? You, it just, it does, it comes out of the box ready to use safely. Is that kind of the goal? That's kind of the goal, right? Is like secure defaults um, yeah. and also have the browser be, you know, fast, appealing, nice looking and usable. Yep. Um, because otherwise, like, you know, you can get most of, many of the benefits of Brave using another browser. You can you harden Firefox or harden Chromium. You have to and install a bunch of extensions. You block yeah. Origin and things like that. Uh, but that's all kind of batteries included with Brave. Yeah, and I think that's valuable because some oh, people yeah. um, don't know how to install extensions right. or don't know how to install ones that aren't completely sketchy and like take over their computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're seeing the big problem actually on uh, on the Chrome side with that. But you do support Chrome extensions. Yeah, we do. So this was actually kind of a long debate because uh, as a security nerd, I am super against uh, allowing people to install whatever extensions they want without some kind of gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, just because like uh, if you want to, you know, if you want to make malware that makes money by injecting um, like advertising links into stuff and, and click through links, one of the easiest ways is to just write a Chrome extension that pretends to be something else and trick people into installing it. Um, that's super easy to do. It's like a very appealing option for malware authors. And I've seen people like get owned by this. Um, you know, they install some extension and then they're like, why is google.com always redirecting to like this <laughs> sketchy looking ad site? Um, oh. Yeah, and then they don't know how to uninstall it, and it's a huge problem. Worse than that. So yeah, for a while, there we are, were... What, sorry, go worse ahead. Worse than that, there are legitimate extensions that get sold and become... Yeah, malware. exactly. Poof. Yeah, they can transfer ownership, yeah. Um, and yeah, anything can happen. So yeah, so with Brave, you know, for the longest time, people were telling us like, oh, you need to support this one extension 
that I absolutely right. must have in order to use a browser. And that's what's keeping me from switching from Chrome to Brave. Um, so finally, we said, okay, we'll support extensions that are in the Chrome Web Store because Chrome does do gatekeeping, like they'll review extensions to be malicious. Not that that's like perfect 100% of the time, but at least it's something. Um, but we'll show like a warning that says, you know, Brave hasn't reviewed this extension. Be careful. Make sure you trust them. Trust the extension author. Um, and in the future, we're gonna do some sort of bet, like more automated vetting to to try and like automatically detect if an extension could be malicious. How does Brave make money? Um, yeah, so that's a, a complicated. <laughs> it's a long answer. So. Uh, Brave has this built-in feature called Brave Rewards, which is optional. So you can use Brave without uh, being plugged into this at all. And the idea of Brave Rewards is to help contribute back to websites. Because like I said, like we talked about earlier, like Brave blocks ads, which is one of the main ways that websites make any revenue. So by blocking ads, like, you know, I feel it's only right if we allow websites to have alternative revenue. And so one of the ways is that um, we allow people to make micropayments, like donations to websites directly, um, uh, either through auto contribute or by tipping specific websites. So when people do that, we take a small cut of the uh, donation. And the other way is through the Brave Ads platform. So Brave has like this new private um, sort of like zero knowledge platform for showing ads locally. So the current ads ecosystem is pretty broken um, because when you click on an ad or see an ad, there's like all these intermediary parties that are tracking you and building a profile on you and looking at what you're clicking and looking at your interest. So the idea with Brave is like we don't, need to leak any data because the browser itself um, locally like knows all your interests and knows what ads it should be showing you. So we have this opt-in private ads, uh, optional private ad system. Um, and so through that, we're getting paid by advertisers and um, yeah, advertisers who want to advertise through this. Mozilla makes millions of dollars a year on Firefox through Google. Google pays them for the search bar. Yeah, so that's another deals. source of revenue. Does Brave also get that money? Yeah, we also have some of that, although it's it's a much smaller percentage than what uh, what Firefox. It's kind of funny because if somebody's really privacy focused, they're probably going to change the search bar to something else like DuckDuckGo or I use StartPage because uh, it's Google. Yeah, so it is possible to have search deals with you know DuckDuckGo and right. uh, oh, other okay. search engines okay. too. So okay, yeah. so there's. Good, because I don't want to take money away from you guys. I want you to, I, I you know, I mean, I, I think we're long past the days where every, people just go, oh, it's free, it's great, I'm going to use it. I think there's always the question, well, if it's free, how, the, how are they making, how are they supporting yeah. people? How are they doing this? Yeah. yeah, that's. I mean, that's so true because, the, you know, there's this old saying, like, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Right, right. <laughs> so. Don't be the product. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to ask you some questions now. If somebody wanted to be... A hacker. What would you? How would you start? This is a question I get asked a lot. I want to learn how to, whether it's discover zero days, or mm -hmm. just, or work for as a CISO, or um, maybe even be, be a black hat hacker. I don't know. I don't ask why. How mm -hmm. would you? Where would you start? What skills would you need? Well, I think I, for most of these things, like having just basic programming ability is fine. Like. Um, like I would say first learn a scripting language, uh, Python, Bash, like even JavaScript with node.js is fine. It doesn't matter which one. Um, but I think the important thing is like, at least I have a hard time learning if I'm just reading a tutorial or like, uh, or like trying to read a book. Um, but it's, it's very easy for me to learn if I have a project I want to do. Um, and like, I have a goal in mind and my only... Uh, and then my mind is only on like, what do I have to do to accomplish this goal? So I would say like, come up with projects for yourself. Like think about what would, it, what would be cool um, that doesn't currently exist and how do I build it and start from there. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's easy enough to learn Python. Uh, there's plenty of resources online uh, for learning that. And you don't need to be a mm -hmm. super skilled coder. You don't need to, to know all the algorithms. You don't need to have five, five kinds of sort to be able to, to write the kind of code you need uh, for this. 
How about yes. other tools like NMAP or Wireshark? Or, or do people need to know those two? That's for more pen testing stuff, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it all depends on what you want to do. Um, I, I've used NMAP tons. Uh, I think it's a great, great open source project. And um, yeah, definitely like as a first pass, if you're trying to uh, figure out if there's anything weird going on with some server, just running NMAP on it is like a great mm -hmm. start. Mm -hmm. um, I've used Kali Linux a few times. I find that's it's a pretty good tool. So it's an operating system Linux based that comes with a bunch of um, hacker Useful, useful tools for hackers just built in out of the box. It's kind of a pen so it's test. It's kind of like Linux. the Linux. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the Linux for pen testers distribution. What so. do you, what are you a Linux user? Windows, Mac? What do you use? Uh, everything except Windows, pretty much. <laughs> That's <Yeah>. my motto. <laughs> yeah. Anything but Windows. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anything Unix with a Unix core at its heart, at its deep, dark yeah. heart. Um, yeah. Do you use Cubes or one of these hyper-secure Linux distros? I used Cubes for about a year. Um, I still have a laptop that has Cubes set up. I think it's a really cool idea, and it definitely makes sense for um, certain threat models. Um, yeah, I think the thing that made me stop using it was I just got annoyed with like it's copying and pasting. It's a pain between, in the ass. <laughs> yeah, between the VMs. <laughs> yeah, there is a, it's a cool idea. We've always said there's sure. a trade-off between security and convenience, and with cubes, Q U B E O S, um, yeah. uh, Q U E B S dash O S, I should say dot org. Uh, yeah. the, the the scale weighs heavily in the security versus convenience. <laughs> yeah, I mean to be fair, I haven't tried it in like over a year or two, so maybe Me it's neither. gotten a lot better. Yeah. but I yeah, still still great idea. <laughs> it's a, it's Edward Snowden's preferred. He says anyway, his preferred. <laughs> and Chris Segoyan likes it too. So that, that's those, those are two people I would trust to yeah. recommend. Um, and then, okay, so learn a scripting language. Ba even Bash. Shell script is actually incredibly useful in in a lot of these uh, scenarios, right? Yeah. yeah. Do, you, sure, like it's, do you need it's, to uh, learn advanced things like fuzzing and uh, timing attacks? Do you need, I could, I can't even understand how, I don't even understand how Rowhammer could possibly work, let alone Spectre and Meltdown. <laughs> yeah, I think if you, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, yeah, certainly for some kinds of security research, like fuzzing finds a lot of awesome bugs with a, like a low cost. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, when I was doing more security research, the stuff I was more interested in was like web security and kind of finding like uh, edge cases and the way browsers handled certain yeah. things. So, I, so for instance, I actually found a timing attack in browsers that you could use to sniff someone's browser history partially. Um, and that, you know, there was no fuzzing you could do for that because it was kind of, uh, like, I guess with fuzzing, you have to have, like, an expected output, you know, which is that you, like, create a crash or something. Mm -hmm. But with this, it was just, like, um, the way I found this was, like, just reading web specs and being like oh what's like a potential security or privacy issue you must have a yeah, mind for this though i think there. that when i look at people what's like that? Uh, you must have a mind for this like we're like tavis ormandy you know where he, he says i was in the shower and i was thinking <laughs> and, I, and i came up with this flaw it, you must have a oh, mind yeah. for it right there yeah must... i'm definitely nowhere near that level of, of tavis but like <laughs> yeah, yeah certainly i think like a lot of people who do security research just think about edge cases a lot they're like edge cases oh that's, that's interesting like yeah. what can go wrong there you know yeah Oh, also, you were uh, uh, at one point responsible for Privacy Badger. We should give you credit for that too. I know a lot of our uh, a lot of our <laughs> listeners use Privacy Badger uh, as well as uh, HTTPS Everywhere and. Well, thanks. Ghost yeah, I, I don't maintain any of these extensions anymore, currently. By the way, but you have. Yeah, like I left the EFF years ago, yeah, and you know, yeah. other people are doing great work with them. Oh, absolutely, yeah. they're still absolutely sure. great. <laughs> music. Yeah. What tool do you use to make your music? Oh, Ableton. Ableton so that's, that's actually the reason I can't fully use Linux is because there's um, no support. I guess there's Bitwig, but that's that's different, and I'm too lazy to learn it. So. <laughs> use use Ableton. Ableton on a Mac. Yeah. Okay. And do you? Uh, what kind of hardware do you use? What kind of MIDI hardware do you use? Um. Oof. I can actually show some of it. Sure. So I have. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just use a keyboard over. or. Uh, so I have this thing called an APC40, and nice. this is kind of. I used to use this for DJing, but now I use. So each of those CJs. buttons has a has a beat or a mix attached to it, kind of. 
Um, so so it's pretty flexible because you can just MIDI map anything to these nice. uh, to nice. these buttons. So you know, for instance, you can s- usually people use like the buttons to launch clips or samples, right. and then they use the knobs for effects and stuff. Yep. Um, I also just have like a little twenty five key MIDI keyboard. <laughs> Um, but yeah, my, my bed, my studio is my bedroom. So it's like pretty, pretty simple. <laughs> I don't even have speakers to be honest. I just use like a head. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, you don't want to uh, annoy the neighbors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you, it's more that I have a rabbit. So like anything I put on the floor, like the rabbit will just chew. <laughs> oh, I know. Rabbits really? love insulation. I just, I discovered that yeah. myself. I had a Did rabbit a going. Issue? Yes. Stuff would stop. My mouse would, and if the rabbit would be under my desk eating the eating the wiring. Oh yeah, yeah. They they, they see love cables it. and they're just like they there's, have to chew them. There's some chemical in it that they like the flavor of. I think. <laughs> Azuki, <laughs> I don't looks, eat wires, Azuki. Yeah, I have to tell them you. that all the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, if your last performance was at DEF CON, are you going to perform at Burning Man? No, I'm not going. <laughs> not. Not going. No, not going this year. Um, Is that a big deal? Not going. No, I mean, I think people who don't go, you know, have a great time just hating on the people who do go. So, you know, you, you feel virtuous for not going. <laughs> yes, that's my excuse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. So let's see. Uh, Vi or Emacs? No, probably neither. Of those. Vim, definitely Vim. Oh, you're Sorry, a Vim. Yeah. You're a Vimmer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm, okay. Vim, Vim forever. <laughs> Vim forever. All right. No, I like Emacs, yeah. but that's all right. I won't hold it against you. I know enough yeah. Vim to be dangerous. The thing that's great <laughs> about Vi and Vim is the macros that you can do so that you you know just a handful of keystrokes you can just through all your stuff i yeah. love that i mean you could do that in emacs too but it's a little you gotta do it in lisp uh let's talk about a couple of topics that i can see from your blog discrete blogarithm uh are on top of the mind the information apocalypse uh yeah. i i think Oof. we're coming close this is the the notion that thanks to things like deep fakes and photoshopping and fake news, you can you can get in a world where you don't know what's right or wrong, what's true or not. And some have dubbed this the uh, information apocalypse. Um, Neil Stevenson wrote about it recently in his novel yeah. Fall. Uh, it, w- it was an interesting uh, scenario in which one of the characters uh, there was getting a lot of trolling. So a hacker came up with the idea, which is actually a genuine idea out there in, in the world, that, well, if we just sprayed so much misinformation through the net about her, no one would know, and much of it obviously, manifestly false. Everybody would just assume it's all false, and nothing, there, all the consequences and harms would be gone. And then what happened is it got out of control. <laughs> Pretty soon you couldn't trust anything you read on the Internet. The information apocalypse. Mm. Yeah, I think this is interesting because, uh, you know, this really came to the forefront of people's consciousness when um, during the Trump election, because uh, there was so many accusations of, you know, quote unquote, fake news. Um, you know, people were saying like Russia was was spreading like these fake memes about Hillary Clinton, et cetera. And so, yeah. And then at some point, it just seemed like you... Well, maybe not for like the technologically savvy, but f- for the average person, it seemed difficult to uh, like tell what was real news and what was fake news. Um, I think there was a story about some guy who just like made a fake news site and like became a fake publisher and, and published news that got like a-, a ton of views and got a ton of attention. Yeah, it and, was like, Macedonian. No one could tell it was fake. It was like it was Macedonian yeah. or somewhere. Yeah. This became yeah. the fake news capital of the world. A whole bunch of people are doing it. And not out of any political uh, animus, but just because it, it was a way to make money. In Neil yeah, Stevenson's exactly. novel, the solution is there's a haves and have-nots. Information haves and have-nots. The information haves are rich enough to hire professional editors to remove the sewage from their internet stream so that they can drink from a pure stream of information. And the rest of us just have to suffer with unknown sources. Yeah, I mean, people like uh, my friend Aviv Ovadia, who actually coined the term information apocalypse, as far as I know, has uh, have have been thinking about this, right? Like in a future where it's so easy to create 
fake pictures, fake video, make a legitimate looking news site. Um, people who have control over like these fake news generating tools just have control over people's minds and like their beliefs about reality. So if you want to live in a world where people like, uh, uh, you know, care about the truth and try to like actually believe in the truth, how do you, how do you make that? You know, you have to have some way of like teaching people like, this is fake and this is real. So you've considered maybe a browser extension? Um, you know, I haven't really thought about this question. I think it's one of those things where I'm like, wow, that's in sounds like an intimidatingly it's hard, hard problem to do. It's hard to do. It is. And, you know, yeah. we talk about this a lot on our show this week in Google because Jeff Jarvis is a, is a journalism professor. And this is, a, this is an issue, I think, you say in a, in a future, but I think the future is here. Uh, between deep fakes and, and, you know, I mean, it's very hard to determine when you're reading something whether there's m truth or not in it. And I think increasingly that's just, it's doesn't it's not going to matter. And I worry about what the world will be like when that happens. <laughs> it may yeah. What it may happen is that just nobody trusts the internet at all ever, which would be sad yeah. too. That'd be sad too. I think that would be kind of sad uh, and in a weird way, like kind of liberating because... Yeah. Yeah, because if someone posts, you know, something bad about you, and they're just trying to like, uh, like make you look bad, then you can say like, oh, you know what? It's they just faked this video of me, you know, punching someone in the face. Um, so yeah, it does give like a little bit more plausible deniability, especially to people who you know are being harassed on the internet. They can say yeah. like, this photo of me or this video of me is just a deep fake, you know. But, That's true. So don't trust anything. You know, yeah, just don't trust anything. <laughs> yeah. Let me ask you about Chelsea Manning. You've known her for some time, and you've oh interviewed God. her a number of times. Yeah, I've known her since 2009 or 2010. Yeah. You know? She's back in, uh, I'm, this makes me so sad. She's in prison, and it's just yeah. been told she's going to be there another year, I think. Yeah, I think up to a year. Um, you know, I think at least this time it's like time limited, but yeah, it still still majorly sucks, and it's it's very very disappointing and sad. Um, so, what's your? Yeah. Uh, I mean, understanding your friends, but what's your what's your take? Some people say, oh, you know, she she was a whistleblower. Some people say, no, she released you know really sensitive data to the public. Uh, what's your take on on Chelsea? Um, I mean, for sure, I think she is a whistleblower. Like, she did what she believed was the right thing. Um, I think people are critical of, like, the way she did it. But, I, I mean, I think her heart was in the right place. And um, that video she released, like, really did make an no impact No kidding. This, is, like, this was when... seeing the horrors of war. Yeah, this is when hand. WikiLeaks like, really yeah. became important. It's become, since, it's become less important for various reasons. But that was the first time I'd heard of WikiLeaks was this collateral damage video uh, mm -hmm. that Chelsea uh, exfiltrated exactly. yeah. that showed U.S. drones being used to kill civilians, to kill journalists. And um, yeah. it was a devastating video. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, had a, I have a friend who actually grew up in a war zone, and he told me, like, when he saw that video, that just uh, it completely blew his mind because it was the first time he had seen something um, that the whole world was seeing where it really ac accurately represented what his life was, like the, the yeah. horrors of war. I think um, it opened so our it eyes. it was very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So she was con court-martialed, convicted uh, under the Espionage Act, sp spent uh, several years in prison. Her sentence was commuted by President Obama a couple of years ago. She was out of prison. But... They, a grand jury has subpoenaed her to testify against Julian Assange, the, the, the creator of WikiLeaks, and she's refused to do so. And so she yeah. is in prison for contempt um, and perhaps for another year, as long as another yeah. year. But she, you know what? I have to admire her integrity because I'm sure after, you know, you, you spend a few years in, in a military prison, you don't want to go back. Oh, yeah. Like, for sure, she did, she did not, like... I mean, it's it's obvious, right? Like she doesn't she doesn't want to be back in prison, but she just believes in her principles very strongly, which is a very admirable thing. And and uh, yeah, she's willing to go to prison for another year to uh, make a point in what she believes. Wow. So. Um, 
I'm, I, it's such a pleasure to talk to you, and I, and I don't want to focus on gender, but I think one of the reasons we wanted to get you on is so that young women could see that there is a path in technology for them and that, uh, and that there's, there's a way that you can survive in what was, I hope I'm going to say was, that's a little hopeful, a male-dominated uh, profession. Uh, are there many, do you know many other women doing what you do? Um, yeah, actually quite a bit. So, Good. um, Good. DEF CON's a pretty, I mean, it's not like, you know, completely gender equal, but there are a lot of, you know, people who aren't men there and, uh, good. yeah, it's a good community. Good. Yeah. And it's a safe, and you feel a safe community. Um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I, I feel like I kind of have a biased view of this because I am pretty involved in DEF CON. Um, I actually help pick talks for them. Nice. So... Yeah, nice. so it, it might just be like you know, safe for me because everyone knows me, and it's uh, like a Zuki privilege. We call it a Zuki uh, privilege. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I don't want to speak for others, but um, yeah. No, I think that's good. I'm really uh, hopeful for all of this. Do you think the code academies and the the hour of code and that kind of thing? You think that's a good place for people to start uh, if they want to? I, I got a question on the weekend. Somebody uh, called the, my radio show and said, "I want to I want to learn how to program. Where should I start?" Mm. Um, I've never done one, but the people I know who have done them have uh, most of them who finished have been pretty successful. So, nice. yeah, yeah, it seems like a good. You probably good learned thing. like I did, just kind of haphazardly picking up bad uh, habits yeah. along the way. <laughs> I <laughs> I, I think I read like maybe one book on JavaScript and then started doing side projects and yeah. then basically talked people into giving me like part time jobs nice. writing code for a couple of years and then nice. yeah, just you gotta gotta hustle. <laughs> so you were able to get work pretty quick. Um, yeah, probably just through like having a few friends, you know, who were starting companies. So one of my earliest jobs, actually I think my earliest paid coding job, um, or a software engineering job was just because a friend of mine had a three person company and they were like, Oh, we need this one Python task done. And I was like, Oh, I'll, I'll do it for like basically no money, you know, just like pay me whatever. And like, I just want some experience. Nice. So, yeah. So that, so that first job was Python coding. Uh, yeah, that actually might've been my second. Do you like, do you still question. like, uh, if, if you were going to sit down and, and hack something together, would you use Python? Um, yeah, so Python, it also depends on what I'm doing. Definitely if I'm doing something that's like, you know, XML parsing for which Python has like a very good nice like, library, standard library yeah, like I would yeah. use Python. Um, you know, my go-to choice surprisingly more and more has been node.js. Really? Um, just cause, yeah, just cause I, I know it really well mm -hmm. having to write JavaScript a lot for my work and, um, yeah. And nodes like not, not that bad. <laughs> Especially with like the latest JavaScript, like ES6 or whatever, it's yeah. a pretty reasonable language. And you, you, you code in plain old JavaScript. You don't use TypeScript or some other uh, layer to protect you against the <laughs> evil JavaScripties. Uh, <laughs> well, if I'm just like throwing together a script for some something, you know, like a one-off task, I'll definitely just use plain JavaScript. Okay. Okay. But um, yeah, definitely for projects like Brave and. Um, some extensions I've worked on in the past, like we use TypeScript or we use uh, Google Closure, which is another type system yeah. for JavaScript. Yeah, I, yeah. I actually uh, really like TypeScript. I'm kind of a bias towards functional programming because I'm an old mm -hmm. person. But yeah. uh, I feel like that <laughs> if you can do it, if it, immutability is your friend. Yeah. Uh, and strong what was your first your language? <laughs> well, that's the <laughs> sad thing. Like, you know, I mean, I, it was basic, right? I'm sure it was basic. <laughs> But that, you know, this was in the seventies. What else? You know, oh wow! What else? You yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. What else yeah, are you gonna Fortran. do? <laughs> and then yeah, Fort. Not quite that old, but yeah, basic. And then uh, and then C, which I mm -hmm. really liked. I really liked C. I, that really attracted me. And I realized the, the thing I liked about C uh, is something I still like about languages, which is it's a very simple language. So the syntax doesn't get in your way. So lately I've been mostly using Lisp for the same reason. Mm. And there's not, there's yeah. very little syntax to it. Uh, and so it just kind of gets out of your way. And I look at stuff like Java and C++ and think, I just, that's too much typing. <laughs> I don't want to type that much. <laughs> I don't like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, hey, it's a great pleasure to talk to you, B-Crypt. Is there, what's your, when's your next concert? 
Uh, I think it's in October. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. You can find um, out by going to her uh, SoundCloud site, soundcloud.com slash A-Z-U-K-I. And thanks for the plug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All I right. love the music. And do you, uh, are you sampling a lot? Do you create your own uh, loops or what do you do? Um, yeah, I sample, you know, sample is actually kind of a tricky thing because of, you know, copyright. Right. So there's a lot of songs I hear where I'm like, oh, that'd be a great sample to cut Yeah, you kind of want to do it. But, yeah. you're like, but you're like, oh, I'll get, I'll get sued or like I won't be able to actually release this on any like label because they can't, you can't use uncleared samples. It's just the way it is. So you make all your own um, beats then? Uh, I make a lot of stuff. There's also this uh, great service now called Splice, which oh. a lot of musicians use and it's kind of... um. It's kind of a repository of uh, royalty-free samples. Oh, that, nice. Yeah. You can just search and like find uh, things in certain keys, within certain categories, etc. I was blown yeah. away when I found out that little Nas X <laughs> play, paid $30 for the beat he used in Old Town Road, yeah, which became the yeah, all-time number one hit of all time. Yeah. That's just the crazy story. <laughs> $30 for that beat. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder how the person who like made that beat yeah, no feels. Kidding. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> like, oh, no, I should have charged more for maybe. it. Maybe, but you know what? Your beat is on the record most listened to record of all time. That's pretty good. I take it. Depends what yeah. your motivation is, I guess. Uh, you know, it, it sometimes ends poorly. I think the person who made that like um, that like drum and bass beat that's used in every drum and bass song. Oh yeah, like that's not you know, good. never got any royalties yeah. from it. Was yeah. basically broke. So yeah. that's not yeah, good. That's, yeah. that's just always a sad, sad story. Yanju, she's chief security officer at Brave. Everybody should check out the Brave browser. It really is a very nice job. Instead of using Chrome or even Chromium. Uh, start with a browser that is privacy hardened, security hardened from the get go, uh, and I think you'll see the difference. It's really a nice browser. Uh, it has a very good sync uh, feature built in. In fact, I love the way you do the sync because you can have every device share all all the bookmarks and settings, but uh, you have a very nice way of authenticating that I think makes it very uh, very easy. Thank and you. It, and it is Linux, Mac, and windows so you can and everywhere. mobile <laughs> and mobile and yeah i yeah, put it on i put it on all my mobile devices uh because it's a it's just a lightweight easy to use uh browser so i love it and it syncs across all those platforms big crypt thank you so much for being here thank you leo appreciate it's it you. we do triangulation on uh fridays usually around 11 30 pacific that's 2 30 eastern time 18 30 or 17 30 utc if you want to watch us do it live, you can at twit.tv slash live. There's audio and video streams there. But really, most people want to listen at their leisure, right? So subscribe to the podcast. That way you'll get it in your inbox on your phone or your device the minute it's available. You can go to twit.tv slash TRI. That's the official web page for it. There's subscribe buttons there. Or just, you know, search for triangulation in your favorite browser. If you're uh, listening to us on an airplane, if you just discovered the show, there are lots of ways you can listen but uh, check out the website for a lot of uh, previous shows. We've, we've done some really interesting interviews uh, over the years. And, of course, my co-hosts who join me, um, Denise Howell, uh, Jason Howell, no relation, Micah Sargent, our newest interviewer, did his first triangulation last week, um, and, and myself, we all uh, enjoy doing the show, and we rotate in people that we're interested in, so you get some really, a good variety of conversations. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on triangulation. Bye-bye.